Uh, it's fantastic to see such a large audience here. Um, when I saw the Astronomy Mini Conference being advertised, I'm very delighted to you know, be accepted to give a talk, but I wasn't entirely sure how many people from the Linux community would want to sit through uh, what is predominantly a science session. We're going to do our best as scientists to, uh, well, at least I will, my students will, everybody else is as well, try and draw what we do into the realm of the conference, being uh, Linux and FOSS as best we can. So. Please forgive me if I sort of drift into the science realm. Stay tuned. I will bring it back to the topic as best I can. I give as my title to this talk, Visualizing the Open Universe, a somewhat grandiose title, which is perhaps a little bit misguided. However, the main point is, which I wanted you to take away from the talk is, as you'll see throughout the talks in this session, there's a lot of data out there coming from the astronomy uh, groups, both present and planned. We're basically being fire-hosed with data. And the common refrain I hear from colleagues in my own group and other groups is, we don't have enough people, slash funding, to analyze all the data coming towards us. So this is a problem. It's a problem now, and it's only going to get worse. When the SKA comes online, when things like the LSST, this big synoptic survey telescope, comes online, there's going to be even more data. That the problem is going to be compounded. So part of the work which I'm interested in doing is seeing how you can package these data to present to people who may not necessarily be experts in the science. You've seen this sort of thing before in terms of science, Chris Linton, Galaxy Zoo, that sort of thing, hugely successful. How do you take data which we are generating and give it to folk who may not necessarily know their uh, coordinate system from the exhaust pipe manifold or whatever? Doesn't matter. We need them eyes on a computer screen to make human decisions. And if there's one thing which I've learned, which I'm sure you guys know, it's extremely difficult to make a computer behave like a human. Give it some data, noisy, gappy, nonsense data, and say, is this a picture of a cup or a kitten? Depends, right? You give it some scrappy and some dust on my primary mirror. Difficult. Difficult. Getting a human to make those sorts of decisions, well, it's easy if you've got a lot of humans. So the primary goal of my talk is just to get an idea of where I'm standing. I'm no expert in uh, the field of open data, certainly. I'm not a database expert. I'm certainly not a computer scientist, for reasons which we'll see, hopefully, I'll try talk. So I'm just going to give a brief overview about me, where I come from, and the project that we're doing talk about my particular research interests, and I'm in the happy situation where I can hand over the discussion of the science to some very gifted students who are in the room who will be talking this afternoon. I get to take this overview managerial, which is fantastic. It's the first time in my life I've to do that. I'm usually the person who's saying, oh, this is what we did. Now I can say this is what my students are doing. It's fantastic. So a little bit about me. I did my PhD here in Auckland. I went to Georgia Bank in Manchester for a postdoc. Uh, the funding went even more south than it usually is in the Nepal state. Then I had to start retraining as a patent attorney. That didn't work out too well, so I skipped into, uh, back into academe. And now I'm lucky enough to get uh, one of these Rutherford Discovery Fellowships to work back in research. My particular research interests uh, in the past, I've looked at variable stars. These are stars which pulsates, otherwise vary their output during time. Uh, I've looked at the structure of our galaxy, and I've looked at high proper motion stars, stars which appear to move very, very quickly. It's interesting sort of collections of stars. Um, what I'm presently interested in is discovering planets. It's like Pauline, Arno in uh, Victoria. I'm also interested in looking at gravitational waves, prediction from general theory of relativity. If you've got two really heavy things crashing into each other like two neutron stars, you'll get waves in the very fabric of space-time. So cool being an astronomer, being able to say waves in the fabric of space-time. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to be a patent attorney? Uh, but as Pauline warned you, there will be a fair amount of this particular scientific study called marker lensing. This is the field which I work in. It's what I did my PhD in. Um, it won't solely be on uh, marker lensing. You'll be pleased to know because that gets a bit dull after a while, even to those of us who are working in the field. Um, however, it's an important one for you to be aware of because it's, something, it's a field in which New Zealand is contributing at world leader level. So it's important science for this country. 
And mining, uh, not in the Australian um, open pit sense, but in the uh, database um, realm, I'm interested in getting into the concept of, well, we're collecting all these data. There are discoveries to be made in those data. And those discoveries are relatively easy to make, if you know how to ask. So this brings me on to a large section of the talk, perhaps, is on using the data that we have already to make emergent discoveries, serendipitous discoveries, lucky discoveries, if you like, value-added discoveries. We set up these massive projects to do very specific tasks. We get our data. We say, yes, we did, or no, we didn't. And then we have these, what well, we call massive, probably not massive to you guys, large data sets in which there's also other discoveries to be made. But writing a research proposal to a government to say, hey, we've got all this data, we want to look for cool stuff because we know it's in there, we think, it doesn't really work that well. They want, you know, you are definitely going to discover something. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> doesn't really work that way. This is pure science, not engineering. It's different. So I like to just have a quick slide about my Linux credentials, such as they are, um, because it does, it does mean something, I think, when you're talking about people, when they're working in computing, in any kind of endeavor that they do, where they came from, how they got to where they are. And so my particular story goes like this. My mum and dad, who were living in Australia at the time, uh, bought me, I suspect secondhand from a garage sale, one of those. Yes. Does anybody recognize that? Just out of interest. Sorry, I heard it. It's a wizard, exactly. You're the only person I know of who actually recognizes this at all. This is, ladies and gentlemen, the Dick Smith wizard. <laughs> Glorious machine. I think my parents bought it to me, uh, gave it to me just to shut me up because it played games, but it also had a little cartridge which you plugged into the machine, and now you start coding basic. And that was it. From 10 years old, that was me coding away in basic. Appalling code, actually my skills haven't really improved, it's just a language. Uh, moving on to MS-DOS, to Windows, which I abhorred, uh, moving into Debian, now we're at university, this is fantastic, and so using Debian Linux, I started doing my PhD. Why did I use Debian Linux? It's because, well, the person with whom I was working on the project said, I use Debian Linux, and therefore, you shall as well. <laughs> I'm just a PhD student, what, what am I supposed to know? It's like, what is this Linux thing? It's like, it's like MS-DOS, you know, it's like command line, that's awesome. Uh, so I just did what I was told. The work we did for a PhD was based on his, his in, in this case is Peter Dobshani. He was a PhD student here working in computer science slash mathematics. Uh, but, but he was a brilliant computer scientist in his own right, and he developed a Beowulf cluster of Dell Optimax machines. Uh, and we used that to discover planets. Kind of cool. What was even cooler was this was a Beowulf cluster. Back in the day, you used whatever machines you had, and those machines were essentially undergraduate computer laboratory machines when the, when the students weren't learning their stuff. Right. So this guy managed to work out how to link these all together to a cluster with his roll-your-own uh, uh, codes, which absolutely brilliant. It worked extremely well. He made it as part of his PhD work. He got his PhD, tick, and then we have this cluster available for use. So I put my hand up and said, can I please use it to do this planet, planet stuff? It worked extremely well, and it was called Kalaka, which I believe is a Hungarian term for uh, the process by which villagers all get together and combine their efforts to complete a common task. So that worked extremely well. I programmed in C, pretty much still programmed in C, and only Oh no. Can anybody guess why that would be? Well, that's a good answer, that's not the one I was after. Anybody else? That's what the libraries are written in. That's another good answer. Anything else? Pardon? Faster. Faster. Anybody else? You, I love you computer scientists. <laughs> yes. Well, I kept. I like that answer. Yes. Easier to spell. Easier to spell. That's good. You can't. Get, yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll take three more because these are great answers. Yes. That's the right answer. <laughs> Somebody was paying attention. <laughs> Debian Linux, because I was told to. You will program in C and only C because that's what the code. <laughs> so that's how it works. Okay. So this is an interesting question you might want to have in the back of your mind when you're training your colleagues or your students or whatever people you come in contact with is ask them, well, how did you get into where you are? And the story I have, this is an interesting anecdote number one, is when I was working at Jodrell, I was working with um, a PhD candidate at the time. He was not my PhD candidate, I hasten to add. He was working with a common boss. But he was a mature student, however you want to 
describe him, but he had worked his career as a computer scientist out in industry. So he came to us and says, yep, yeah, made my money, made my career, it's all good. I want to do some astronomy. So he came to us. And my boss said, you go and write up some uh, code to model the galaxy, any galaxy. So he went, fine. And uh, what uh, language would you like that to be in? And my boss went, C. <laughs> and the, the PhD candidate said, well, I don't know C. But it doesn't matter. And that's where, I, that's where I knew that's what a computer scientist was. It didn't matter. And he then proceeded over the next three years to write the most beautiful code I've ever seen in my life. And that's when I realized that computer science, or computer coding, is an art. It is an art form which can be beautiful. I have not achieved this. I will not show you my code. It is, <laughs> it is horrible. <laughs> but it is commented. Thank you. <laughs> So I can appreciate the abilities of a good computer scientist, and, and I try and impress this on people who aren't familiar with what computer science is, because we get, we get students like that. We work in physics. It's the interface, mathematics, computer work, programming. Here's some data. We use a computer. We don't use graph paper anymore and rulers. We use a computer. We write code to fit that straight line. Not a ruler. And the eye. Yeah, discuss. Not now. But the important thing is being able to see that computer programming is something which becomes something more than just the language that you're in. Fortunately, I've not progressed any further. I know there are such things as Python and Perl, and I can even read these things, so this, it's not native yet. Anyway, I move on. Uh, the cluster was comprised of lab machines running after hours, as I mentioned, and there's, not, there's something very special about driving out to a remote campus at you know, 7 p.m. to restart 300 machines by hand. <laughs> and this is, you know, leads me on to the next point, is this was off the grid, in a sense, excuse the term. This was a project that the um, computer science authorities, the computer science help folk, knew about, but were, un were not prepared to, you know, th th this is your project, it's your Beowulf cluster, not ours. We're not going to, you know, help you. We'll make sure the machines turn on when you push the button, and we'll talk about networking you know, availability and stuff like that, but, you know, if the thing falls over, it, you, know, you made it fall over. These days, so yeah, unofficial computing project, which was still a huge success. These days, we use the HPC machines at available to you, and the situation in 10 years has changed dramatically. I now have a name of a person and a phone number who I can call for help. <laughs> right? <laughs> this is a sensational advance, highly to be commended. When I was still working, uh, let's go back six, seven years, and I was working uh, in the UK, we hadn't quite evolved to that point. So the computer science help that was available online, right, you know, web pages, written by computer scientists for other computer scientists. Yes, there are sniggers out there, because I think we realized that, you know, being told the minutiae, the detail of how this thing works, not, I need to run some code. This is, you know, me as a user. It's not working. Help, please. We were still at that point. It got to the point where it was easier for me to get an account, rather use my colleague's account at another institution by calling him and saying, can I please use your account because I cannot understand this web page for getting through this Byzantine login system. It's just too confusing. It was easier for me to use his account at another institution. Not good. Things have now got much, much better. Like I say, a name on a card who can understand Linux, understands everything that I'm trying to do, and will even offer to debug my code. I haven't tried him on this because I think the relationship will go sour. <laughs> <laughs> like I mentioned, the code isn't pretty, but it works. Uh, so going from this unofficial computing project through to the work that we did, you know, for me and successive students here at Auckland, there's been a long list of them, under the um, uh, guidance of my uh, PhD advisor, Phil York, uh, the science has now um, evolved to a, a degree. So that's me, that's my PhD. Um, I evolved myself to using Ubuntu. I don't know why, I like it. Um, there was an unfortunate incident when um, I <laughs> had to leave astronomy and find another job, so I started training as a patent attorney. Never got there because I was about to die from the stress. Uh, but that meant I had to start working with this again, and 
they very nearly lost their computer a n- number of times, which they gave me because it was slow and it was irritating, and I just didn't have the patience for it. However, uh, the work that I was doing for them you know, put me into contact with you know, strange, you know, familiar places. I started to work. Um, one of our clients was Red Hat. So the experience I had working with them, apart from a newfound interest in you know, how the law works in particular, uh, maybe not the practice of it so much, but how patent law works in, in particular, it was fascinating. But learning uh, about the role which patent law works or doesn't work in a free and open source community, that was an interesting experience. So that's a little bit about me and my background, going from the wizard through to Ubuntu. Let's talk about a little bit of uh, the present work which I'm doing. And like I mentioned, I'm in this happy position of being able to add talks of students who will be talking later this afternoon. Uh, the broad umbrella, if you like, where these data are coming from, is this group. Pauline mentioned it in her talk. It's the Microlensing Observations in Astrophysics group. It's a combined Japan and New Zealand collaboration. It started in the early 90s and is still going on. We'll data here, telescope down the South Island, more on that later. But the overall, where is all this coming from? It is this collaboration, the moral collaboration. So, as an advertisement, Ashna later on will be talking about detecting extrasolar planets using this newfangled technology of GPUs. And it's going extremely well. So I recommend that talk to you. Alex will be talking about discovering extrasolar planets through this particular technique of eclipse timing. Nothing to do with microlensing. However, we're using the same data. Again, we're coming back to this, this open data, so to speak. We're squeezing more science out of, not just finding what we set out to look for. Martin will be talking about automatically classifying data from these large data sets using open source software, in this case, using the Weckert uh, suite of tools. So please do attend those talks and take a look at the science because all you're getting from me is a lot of, um, well, some amusing anecdotes, I guess. So again, about the Moa project, this is some uh, more um, advertising. Here's what we do. We look for planets. Planets are mainly discovered through these techniques, through transit technique, the radial velocity technique, there is no test, don't worry. The microlensing technique, which is what we use in direct imaging. Here's what we've done, well, here's what the community, as in humankind, have done so far. On the y-axis, we have planetary mass, the planet's mass in units of Jupiter. And down the bottom here, we have the uh, distance of the planet orbiting from its host star. So there's Jupiter there at, not surprisingly, one Jupiter mass orbiting at Jupiter's distance around the sun. And all the black dots are those planets found by various techniques by other collaborations around the world. There's Earth, and we're looking for Earths. So we, as in humankind, are doing quite well. If you've been paying attention to the recent media, we're finding planets similar to our own Earth in terms of mass and distance away from its host star. Have we found life? No. Have we found aliens? No. Right, that's out of the way. What we're trying to do, of course, is trying to dig down towards this region here. I should say, have we found aliens, have we found life? No, not yet. <laughs> We're trying to carve out this uh, space here, getting closer and closer to Earth. So, just as a reminder, the transit technique is very, very simple. Physics is easy. Here is a star. Some of those stars will have planets. <laughs> and some of those planets will be orbiting at stars, such that the planet occasionally passes between us, the observers, and the background star. You look at the star long enough, you'll see it's mainly bright, 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 as the planet moves in front of it, a dip. Uh, transit technique, very easy. That's the sort of data that you see. The radial velocity technique is somewhat different. Here you're looking at a star, you're looking at its spectral lines, you're looking at wavelengths, you put the light through a spectrograph, you see absorption lines from the star. Uh, but an unseen planet will be pulling, maybe pulling that star backwards and forwards relative to you, and what you see is a Doppler shift. We're all happy about Doppler shift? Splendid. So what you see is this regular Doppler shift. You see, over time, the star being pulled away, towards, away, towards, away, towards, away, towards. We use neither of these techniques. <laughs> Come on, that's easy physics. <laughs> Let's get Einstein in the room. Come in, Mr. Einstein. Einstein's uh, 
general relativity predicted that the gravitational field of a massive object would deflect light. Here's a cartoon showing exactly that. Here's us. This is the planet Earth on which we are all. Here is a background star. If we have a background star and a foreground object like another star, lining up almost exactly, the light from the background by the gravitational potential of this foreground object in a manner similar to an optical lens. Take a lens and pass it between your eye and a street lamp in a motion like this, and you'll see the light appear to get brighter than fainter. Pretty much the same deal here, except our lens is made of gravity. The very space-time fabric. It's great. <laughs> this doesn't have to be a star. This is the cool thing. This thing here does not have to be a star. It could be, for instance, a black hole. All we care about is the gravity, because we're not looking at the light coming from the foreground object. We're looking at the light coming from the background object. So this thing could be a star with gravity, a black hole with gravity, or even a planet by itself with no star. One of the primary recent discoveries made by the microlensing community is that there is strong evidence for a large population of silivalent planets. Free-floating planets to everybody. I don't know why somebody came up with silivalent, but anyway, planets without a star floating through the galaxy. There's no reason really why we shouldn't think that they don't exist. It's just because we can't see those sorts of planets with those other two techniques because we're relying on some kind of effect on its host star. The transit technique, the radial velocity technique, needs a planet going around it to change the quality of the light coming from it. Microlensing, we don't care about that. But let's go back to the standard case where we think that the lens object is possibly containing one or more planets going around it. Those extra planets will change the characteristics of the lens. You take your nice, smooth, symmetric lens and then take a pickaxe and chip a bit out of it and you're going to get a glitch. So we're looking for these glitches due to the gravity of a planet. Another thing to distinguish these, uh, the microlensing technique from the other techniques, the transit technique, direct imaging, radial velocity, is that those other techniques are looking at stars close to us, our local neighborhood. We, in contrast, this is the fried egg of our galaxy, looking side on. This is us here, about two-thirds of the way out of the galactic disk, looking towards the very dense regions, the center of our galaxy, at stars there. Light being bent by a foreground object there, which is pretty much in the same position towards the center of the galaxy. What we're getting at here is we're looking at different population of planets. We use this telescope as the 8-meter MOA telescope in the south part of New Zealand. Down here, this is beautiful Lake Tekapo. Tekapo Township's around about here. Mount Cook is somewhere up here. I'm not a geographer. And the telescope is around about there. Uh, aerial view. This is where I spent a lot of my time um, staring at the sky uh, in the freezing cold for one year. But then they built this nice new building here with um, much uh, better facilities. This is the housing dome for the 1.8 meter telescope. This was built and designed by the Japanese and operates here. Uh, New Zealand company designed a particular uh, part of the optics to install in there, and a New Zealand observer is there uh, full time making observations. Here's what happens the telescope with camera, this camera comprised of 10 2K by 8K, sorry, 2K by 4K CCD chips. It's a large camera. It's observing about 2.2 square degrees on the sky. In context, that's large. We observe lots and lots and lots of stars. Each one of these stellar images is fed into a stack here, a cluster here, down on the mountain, curated by this man here. This is Professor Ian Bond. He works at Massey University up in Albany. And he makes pretty much all the computing work down on the mountain. Uh, the details of this machine here are, I haven't got that many details, but there's about 10 CPUs running. A particular type of image analysis, you're looking at effectively 50 million stars every night. 50 million spots of light, and you're looking for a change. So citizen science isn't going to help us in this case. <laughs> However, Ian, um, Ian Bond, working on developing a particular type of image analysis called difference imaging, has made this routine. So, back to me. Uh, from the computer, we get all these data points. Da, 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 da. And the two different colors there represent data from two different telescopes observing the same event. This is a microlensing event. 
I get these points. I put it through some code, which I'm using uh, collaborators in Japan and also in the States, um, which is probably better commented than mine. Uh, I run this code in part on the HPC facilities here at Auckland. I get some results. And basically, the long shot is I get a line, short story rather, I get a line going through the data points. And that extra little bump here, which is contained in this set of data up here, at the moment looks to be like a Saturn, a Saturn mass planet. That's what I do, finding these sort of planets using these data. But you can see that there's a long path to go. Lots of people involved. Ashton may talk more about that in, in her talk. So microlensing, this particular technique, requires, like the other techniques, at least the transit technique, observing millions of stars. It requires delicate image analysis. And I, again, advertise the amazing efforts of Professor Ian Bond at Massey for doing this, making this routine. The whole project was set up, the model project was set up with the idea of finding dark matter. People know what dark matter is? Excellent. No, we don't know what that is. Would we like to know what it is? Yes, we would. <laughs> Trick question. <laughs> I can't claim it, but I saw it before. <laughs> Somebody else is a brilliant one. Yes, we were looking for dark matter. There's a component of the universe of which we know nothing about. It is really a little embarrassing. So we call it dark matter. Uh, but the project, the model project was set up amongst other projects around the world to look for evidence for dark matter. Because it's dark, we still think it has gravity. It's dark, but it has gravity. We can detect it through microlensing. That's the whole wheeze, right? We didn't need to get photons from it or any other kind of radiation from it to try and figure out if it was there and if so, what it was. So microlensing. It's got gravity. Let's see if we can detect it. Did we find it? Well, we didn't find the dark matter that we thought it was going to be in the way that we thought it was going to be. So what do you do? Well, you repurpose your experiment. Let's find planets. And that's, that's how it worked. So that's how, we, that's how we've evolved from a dark matter project. We had, well, I say, you know, we didn't find it. We set some pretty good upper limits on what it is. Great. Job done. No result. However, move on. Let's find planets. And these are our successes. What is interesting to me, however, and this is where we're starting to, I'm trying to haul you back to where we're supposed to be. The, sci the first scientific return from the MOA database, or the MOA project rather, was not a confirmation of what is dark matter, or not, nor was it finding extrasolar planets. It was an emergent discovery, it was research into variable stars. You stare at millions of stars night after night, you can't help but noticing that some of those stars are variable, we know about these things, but you have now got lots of them. Lots of data means you are able to make more fine questions about the topic of study. So while we're discovering extrasolar planets, what other serendipitous discoveries await in the data? So this is a question which I alluded to earlier on. So Alex will be talking about eclipsing binaries. Can we use this to find planets? And Martin Donaki doesn't mean I don't know what he's talking about. So I do, because I told him <laughs> what to research. But the idea here is that he's classifying these data hopefully, or largely autonomously, with the view of, okay, here's a piece of data, that's a variable star, not too interested, one, it's one of those, know about those as well, don't know what on earth these things are. And this is where we write papers, okay? This is where we get our research from. That's the, that's funny part of science. We know about these, we know about these, I want a pile of weirdness to look at. And it's remarkable, it, well, I say it's remarkably easy, it is something of low-hanging fruit with these databases. We set these databases up, or rather we collect these data into databases from experiments set up to look for one thing, and we keep on plugging it trying to find that one thing, because that's you know, what we set up to do, right? We said we're going to find planets, let's find some planets. But we're still you know, shoveling data into our database. And we haven't got the time, nor resource, nor et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, slash funding to set people looking at those There, yeah. They are there. for anyone to use. And this is an open question for you guys. You're the experts in this sort of stuff. We haven't done this yet. We have some friendly collaborators, the Ogle Collaboration. Uh, they're doing pretty much the same science. They're looking for planets using microlensing, but they are a Polish-US collaboration observing out of Chile. Uh, but they have put their data available via website. Um, do we want to do the same thing? Is there a better way of doing it? I'm not sure. I'm not going to go into the details about the ins and outs of whether what they do is right or the best way do possible. That's not the purpose of the talk. I'd like to talk to people here about what are the best technologies these days for making largest maps of data available for people to use. 
So just to reemphasize, when you collect enough data, you see, weird, you see weird stuff. But everybody has different ideas on how to query the data. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in doing is looking at the new technologies, apart from the computer science side of things, is there a particular style of database which we should be looking at or using? It's over to you guys. I'd love to hear some comments. But also in the hardware, um, and also, also the software here, first of all, looking at open source visualization of data. It, one of the tasks which I did, which was this low-hanging fruit, what's in the database, I took one of these databases, and I asked a very simple question. I came up with two statistics, which were very quick to compute, because my collaborator running their database wanted something very quick to compute, because he had to run it on you know, terabytes of data. Two simple statistics, and out popped a result, which was interesting. Very easy. Maybe one of those low-hanging fruit sort of stuff. But I, I don't know whether that's necessarily the right, the, the right way to go about it. It just seems to be the right thing for me. It was that intuition or luck, we don't know. But that was my take on how to look at the data. Everybody else will have different ideas on how to query the data to make that easy for people to do. So that kind of brings us in towards data visualization. And I like, to look, I like that to be an open source project. I like that to be a piece of code which people, if they wanted to, could hack themselves rather than some proprietary piece of software which they have to obey the dictates of the programmers. You don't understand how the code works at all. That's what I'm interested in, in doing. So there is some work here, um, AstroViz and Paraview, these are uh, one to plug into the other um, for doing this sort of thing, but it seems to be for quite a specific goal, if you like. I'm also interested in the, uh, the interface between science and programming. I, I, I read a talk um, by Gail Veroqua, and apologies for pronunciation, but I was fascinated that the conclusion out of that talk was that the the science and the programming are interlaced at the data level. So the data informs you of what you, science you can do, and those two together inform you on how you program to get that science out. So these things aren't disparate. And I'm interested in looking at the machine learning package from Scikit, the Python thing, and uh, the, the Python uh, pipeline thing, uh, together to see whether we can utilize those things and what we want to do. And just finally, this is a plea or a challenge or um, point. I love Stellarium. It's a fantastic piece of open source software. Love it. Pauli mentioned it in her talk, and work that she's using, uh, what she's using Stellarium for. We use it in our teaching laboratories as well to get students an idea of the uh, nature of the night sky for those of us who live in cities and all we see is light pollution. But I want to take it further. And I thought, when I saw this thing on the market, I started drooling. <laughs> and it wasn't because I could play my favorite games, because I'm not much of a gamer, unfortunately. But it was, what can this thing do for data visualization? And I've been into data visualization suites. You're in a room like this, and you've got head tracking, and eye tracking, what have you, and you have 15 screens or something like that. And you are immersed in the data, and it's wonderful. However, I don't have that much money. I don't have the necessary 100 kilo currency units to buy anything remotely like that. But I might be able to convince the HDD to buy me one of these. <laughs> <laughs> the idea being is I want to interrogate the data in a way which is intuitive and exciting and fun and stuff like that and what have you, but that will be for me. But I'm also quite happy interrogating data 2D on a computer screen. I'm quite happy about deprojecting data, you know, 2D, 3D and back again and stuff like that. I can see that. But back to what I was talking before about computer science outreach, if you like, or utilizing all those fantastic you know, graphics processing units between your ears, or the school kids' graphical processing units between their ears, I want them looking at data in a way which will help me to produce science. And I kind of think that this could be a way forward. This could be something which we could look at. This is unfortunately owned by this, so that makes me sad. That's made me sad at all. It's, 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 these are companies, and this is how they work, right? But I want to see what the open source community can do. I want to see what the open source hardware community can do, which will compete in a way which I don't have to pay quite as much as a full-blown version. Challenge. This is basic, I believe, the Microsoft Research Worldwide Telescope, because that has got Oculus Rift support. Splendid. Here's the open source version of it. I know that the, I started this by going, hey, can you not just like plug Stellarium into an Oculus Rift and you fly through the space? It's not that easy, apparently. 
I think it's doable. There are some in- there are interesting things about the human, um, uh, the, the human interface, if you like, on how you drive Stellarium through an Oculus Rift and that sort of thing. Because I looked up on, online and people have addressed this very thing and thought, yeah, we can try and do this. Oh, crash wall. It's actually a little bit more difficult. However, I'm just here to say that there are applications for the sort, these sorts of technologies in the stuff I do in the classroom teaching students. Uh, there's two aspects of this. Um, I grew up looking at Hubble Space Telescope images. Glorious images once they fixed it. Absolutely stunning astronomical images. Beautiful. It's not enough for some kids these days. Some kids these days. <laughs> How old am I? You take my point. We are saturated now with sensational images and even the stuff which I certainly look at and go, wow, this really turned me on to astronomy even more than I already was. It's fantastic. Some kids are still like a little bit blasé about it. So we need to move in step with that. Use the, more late, the latest technologies to well, basically impress them with the already impressive, to me, images that we already have, for instance. So this is going beyond just looking at data. This is now engagement with students at a level which, with which they expect us to provide. And also... An, there are other teaching, yeah. so this goes, this, this goes to impact, but also things like, if you want to know what equatorial coordinates are, for those of you who don't know, this is how we map the night sky, or the sky, if you like. We have a set of coordinates, right ascension and declination. They're essentially analogous to uh, longitude and latitude here on Earth, but they're projected up into the sky. And so you can say, oh, right ascension 18 hours, declination minus 29 degrees, you point the telescope, there's your thing you want to look at. We try and teach this to uh, students in our undergraduate lab for you know, various reasons. And it's extremely difficult for some of folk to get a grip of what this is, what this means. You say, oh, yeah, go read Wikipedia. Mm, well, Wikipedia entry is correct, but it's really hard to get a grip on it, just intuitively. My view is if you have something like that on your face, you'll get it immediately. So, again, this is trying to provide the best teaching environment that we can with a technology that we know we can do, but I want to do this open source as best as possible. That's a challenge of mine to the community. Um, that's all for me, so thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Nick. That was uh, wonderful. If we have any questions, we do have a few minutes before we have to head off for lunch. Um, who would like to start off? Just quickly. Wait, wait. Sorry, please wait. Well, yeah, just what? please wait. Silly, what's the planet? Yeah. Hmm? What, what's that word? Silly, what's it word you used for roaming planets? Oh, crap. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't use it because I prefer free floating, but I'll try it. So live. Uh, I think. Any chance that those would add up to the missing dark matter? No. I try, but I don't think so. Uh, that. Hello. Sorry, sorry I, 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 I said molecular hydrogen from behind me. <laughs> uh, the plot that you showed of um, masses of planets that mm. we've discovered, they seem to cluster in groups. Is yes. that because of the way we're looking for them? Correct. Or do we, right. That's right. So the techniques um, of. Uh, Doppler or radio velocity technique of transits, they tend to, they started or large planets close into the host star. That's basically the nature of the physics. That's where they get the largest signal. Now you're getting better and better at finding planets further and further away because you're improving the data. You've also got things like Kepler Space Telescope doing, you know, observing from space. So that's starting to broaden out now. Microlensing, um, weirdly, is more sensitive to planets further away from its host star than the so-called Goldilocks zone, which I really dislike the term, but we understand it's the, that region where, not too hot, not too cold. Uh, um, microlensing finds planets in general further away out of, of that. In itself is interesting because we still need to know how those planets form to get a good picture on how planetary systems in general form. Uh, have you... Have you made use of the uh, IPython notebook and for the data um, Yeah, do you use that? With, like, what is this thing that you speak I, no. of? Hmm? What is this that you IPython speak of? IPython notebook. Yes. Um, it's for like visualization um, 
of like it integrates like matplotlib and that I highly recommend checking it out if you're not okay. aware of it. This is why I came. Yeah. Thank you. I Python notebook. Thank you. I, you discover a uh, number of planets and different characteristics, and but you probably have an estimate of how easy it is to discover planets in the different areas, and you that to get an idea of how many planets there actually are. Because if it's 50 percent easy to get a planet in this area than that, then you know the actual number of planets is going to be doubled every year. Are you are you asking when we talk about? Um, Regions of the galaxy, for instance, are you asking? You know, are, uh, we, are we learning more about planets in different regions of the galaxy, or and, and, and any method like um, uh, if you detect one percent of planets using this method? Yes, you can run the numbers back and get a population estimate. Yeah, yeah, you can do that, and this is where we sort of discover that actually planets aren't uncommon. In fact, they're the opposite; they are littering the galaxy. We assume that most stars actually have a planet of one flavor or another. Again, we can make also these predictions of, given the number of these guys that we've discovered, given the efficiencies of the telescope, given the efficiencies of the observation program, we can say, well, actually, there's a big population of these as well. So yes, we can. We run the numbers backwards. Given the efficiencies of how we work, given the number of detections, we work it backwards and we work out what the population should be. Um, if I wanted to get involved, do you have an issue tracker for low-hanging fruit? How do I get in touch with you to help out, write some code, tell you about technology? Um, the answer is no, because we're not there yet. Again, this is, this is, we, we, you would like to have the data ready for you to, to look at, presumably, right? Yeah, just something that I can solve right now. No. Write that code. That's, that's the thing. The next time... Uh, one of the attendees, uh, she's presently at Harvard, I think, is the Center of Astrophysics, but she is driving forward a project of let's have a competition. Who can write the best microlensing code, for instance, right, to model these things so that I suspect, this is not necessarily what's in, in her mind, but I suspect we will be able to package and hand out to the community and say, here's our web page data, you run it and tell us what you found. And that's what I would like to see. So, but we're all individuals, I guess. I'm using code from my colleagues have written and I'm adapting and using, which is what happens, you know, when I left my PhD. I had my code, which I'd written, handed it on, people took it, adapted it, but we all end up with running different sets of codes, different coordinate systems, and it's all very exciting when we try and analyze the same thing because we all got to agree on what, you know, we've, how we've set the problem up properly. That has advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantages you could probably see is that as you, know, you write your own code, you understand it, and unless you comment it very well and no one else understands it, the um, advantage of having separate people running separate codes is that if you agree with an error buzz, then you're more confident that you found the right thing. Yeah? If you're running one set of code which nobody understands or one person understands, you're going to get the same answer usually if you put the same data in. So there's a disadvantage. So we're trying, we're, we're, there is, um, this has been in the community for a long, long time. So there's tension there which we're trying to resolve, and Jennifer Yee at Harvard is, I think, in some way trying to address that. So we're not there yet, but this is the sort of thing which we would like to be there. Who's? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I get the impression that a lot of the innovation and approach here is in the software and the methodology rather than the actual observation. Is that, first of all, that is a fair the statement. case? And as such... Can you use your techniques on databases, older databases, and data that was collected before you started doing this work and make similar discoveries and mine it from there rather than make new observations as well? I don't see why not. And, and there is work in the community where um, people have gone, oh, here's, here's a set of data that we have, which is a contemporary database, but let's go back and see what was found on those old photographic plates, which have been painstakingly digitized and put online and stuff like that. So people j seem to go from, here's something which I found in an interesting contemporary data set, but the information from previous data sets long ago, say 10 years ago, uh, would be useful. Right? So that it, it, it seems to me, and that's an impression of mine, I don't you know, necessarily say it's exactly always going to be the case, but it seems that you discover something now with your contemporary data set and you look to see what else was known beforehand. 
I don't know whether anybody has taken the data set from long ago and then gone forward or searched in those days. Mainly, I think, because contemporary data sets are far richer than what we had in the past. Again, personal impression rather than necessarily true. Okay, thank you, folks. Um, I know there's a few of you who still have questions, and unfortunately, we are heading into lunch, and um, I think bellies are also rumbling. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. That was a fantastic presentation, um, very engaging. Um, I think you'll be around for a few minutes, will you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if anyone really has any burning, desperate questions, remember questions. Um, Nick will be around, and uh, we'll answer your questions now. Thank you.